Welcome to another episode in Lessons in Humanities. The title of today's lesson is Religion and Reform. Today I'm going to I'm going to be talking about the second great awakening in the United States. And in this lesson you'll learn about where some of the different denominations of the Christian religion, the Protestant religion in the United States come from. So you'll learn where baptism or the, the Baptist religion or the Methodist religion or the Mormon religion come from. I will also talk about different reform movements that were happening in the 1800s, about the same time of the Second Great Awakening, which will include the temperance movement, the anti-slavery movement, and the women's rights movement. So if you find that interesting, please stay tuned. Before I begin, if you are interested in this PPT or other great lesson plans for teachers, please check out my store below. Also, please hit the like button and subscribe. I really need the help with the algorithm. So if you think this content is useful, whether you're a teacher or a student, please just take one second and hit that like button for me. All right, so let's begin. So we are going to be talking about the, the 1800s uh, when there was lots of change in the United States. So here's a timeline. Between 1800 and 1848, the United States is going to get much bigger. Obviously, with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, it's going to double the size of the United States. And more and more people are going to move to the United States after about 1815 or 1820. They're going to be coming from Ireland and from German, the German states and different places. And different types of people are going to be coming to the United States, and they're going to bring their traditions and their cultures and their religions with them. But there's a lot of change during this time period. And with that change, there's going to be the Second Great Awakening. And from the Second Great Awakening, there's going to be new religions. And there's also going to be reform movements to try to fix a lot of the problems that were happening in the United States at that time. So just imagine living at a time when there is so much change. So I'm sure there's a lot of change in your life right now. And there really is. I mean, from the time you're born to the time you die, you're going to see lots of different uh, technological advances, advantages, lots of um, things or depressions or good or bad events are going to happen within your lifespan. So you're going to see a lot of change. And that's no different than the 1800s. The 1800s, uh, while you wouldn't see as many technological advances as you would today, right? So when you were born, you might not have had a mobile phone. Now you have everybody has a mobile phone, right? But there were some great advan uh, technological advantages. Ad advances, sorry. So just think about the railroad, think about the steamships, think about the telegraph. You know, now you could talk, you don't have to travel on horseback for, for days to send a message. You could do it with a, with a telegraph. So lots of chains, and how do you cope with that change? So uh, economic, yeah, there was the Panic of 1819, the Panic of 1837. The Panic of 1837 was comparable to the 1929 Great Depression. In fact, it was called the Great Depression at that time. So that's going to cause a lot of uh, hardship and a lot of change. Political, there's going to be lots of political problems. They're going to be going from a two-party system to a one-party system back to a two-party system. Uh, there's going to be corrupt bargains. There are just going to be very um, controversial presidents, Andrew Jackson-like. Uh, so that's going to happen in the, the early to mid-1800s. Social changes, right? I mean, what is accepted in society with uh, demeanor or what is your behavior or even uh, gender roles. Those are going to be changing in the 1800s. Demographic, like I said, lots of people coming in from Europe. And then eventually they're going to be coming from Asia as well. So that's going to bring some change and controversy because they're not always welcome. And then territorial, the United States is going to get bigger and bigger in the 1800s until it reaches the Pacific Ocean. Americans search for comfort in times of uncertainty. And that's what's going to lead to the Second Great Awakening, right? People want to find something to believe in. People want to find something to make them feel better, something to um, um, a, a faith for for community for 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 their for their belief in a uh, higher spirit, their 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 religious beliefs, uh, and the Second Great Awakening is going to going to bring that because there's been Christianity and in Judaism and in the United States. Um, 
since the beginning. I mean, the reason there's lots of Christianity in the United States is because a lot of the early settlers are from Europe and they would bring their religion. So it's not new, right? Religion is not new there. Um, uh, now, there, there's, there's really no Islam at this time in the United States except for some of the slaves who had come from Islamic traditions in, in, in Africa and they would pass those on or they would, um, you know, the, the tr slave trade would be illegal in the early 1800s. But there really wouldn't be too much Islam at that time or Buddhism. The Asians would bring some in in the, in the mid-1800s. So at this time, it's mostly um, Protestantism in the United States. I mean, there's Catholicism too, but they were not always accepted at that time. But the Irish are bringing more and more Catholics into the United States. So mostly Protestantism. And if you remember before that, the United States was surrounded by the French and they were Catholic. And the Protestant and Catholics didn't always get along. Uh, but the French are going to leave after the French and Indian War. The Spanish are still there, and there's going to be conflicts with them as well. Uh, but the United States was largely Protestant in the early part of the Republic. And it was spread in the First Great Awakening in the 1730s and 1740s. And in that First Great Awakening, you had a new religion called the Methodists, right, which was... Um, uh, a new religion that was would allow people to find salvation through their deeds or for their faith in God. Um, but religion would, would kind of ebb and flow where there's lots of religious zeal and when there's not so much religious zeal, right? And the Second Great Awakening and the First Great Awakening are going to bring that zeal back. So my first point here is it awakened religious zeal. And this is from, let's say, the early 1800s, a little bit, 1810, 1815 to about the 1840s or 1850s, the Second Great Awakening, right? And what happened during this period is that religious zeal is back, like I said, and the Protestant revivalists and preachers, they traveled through the United States on horseback from town to town spreading their faith. And these were different denominations, right? Um, and it was hard to get to people in the West because the West was hard to get to because even though there's internal improvements at that at this time, it's the market revolution, there's canals and roads are being built, it's still not easy to get too far far west. And they want to bring religion to, to the West. So they have these religious revivals or these camp meetings, kind of like in this picture here, which were very emotional. People would be crying, people would be shouting, people would be speaking in tongue. Uh, it'd be very influential, and the word would spread. And this this would help Christianity become and remain uh, important in the United States. But there was this, also this idea of, of spiritual egalitarianism. So before that, especially in colonial America, especially in New England with the Puritans, it wasn't equal, right? Uh, basically, they believed in something called predestination, the Puritans. They believed in predestination where you were predestined to go to heaven or hell, which means salvation. Now the idea is, well, you, anybody could do it. You just have to have faith in God and, and follow some traditions and uh, be good and help people and uh, help the poor and stuff like that. I mean, it depends on what denomination you're a part of, but you could, you could, it was your responsibility to find salvation. So that's a big change. That's going to take place during the first Great Awakening and even more in the second Great Awakening. But this idea of spiritual egalitarianism also gave hope to some of the African slaves that were in the South. Uh, this, they got this, this feeling of being equal to other people, at least spiritually. And some slaves were brought to some of these meetings with their masters so they could hear this message. Um, but this spread of religion also sparked reform movements because religions often want to do good for the society. And there was a lot of help that was needed in the 1830s, in the 1840s, and around that time period. So I put this here to try to simplify it. I made it myself using lots of different resources because it gets, it gets confusing about the Protestant religion, right? And uh, what they believe in or what are the differences. And often, often the differences are so subtle, right? But basically you have the early Christian church, right? And this is before the Protestant Reformation. 
and that that had the great schism or it divided between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Then from the Roman Catholic Church, you have the Protestant Reformation, uh, Martin Luther. Uh, so that was so that would be split into two between the Roman Catholic Church, which believed in having a pope and had these beautiful cathedrals with stained glass and gold, and then the Protestant Reformation that didn't believe in all that pomp and all that beauty and all that. They believed more in a, of simplicity, and they didn't believe in having a, a human leader like the pope as a leader. So that was the Protestant Reformation. And then from there, more and more would develop and continue to develop, and we'll probably have more that will continue in the future, um, which, are just de- which, is, are, which are just different denominations of the Christian religion. And the first one was Luther- Lutherans, or Lutheranism from Martin Luther. Uh, but other relevant ones were the Anglicans. Now, this is relevant in American history because the Anglicans, which is the Church of England, is obviously going to be influential in the United States because the United States used to be a part of England or Britain. And Anglicanism is going to spread in the United States, right? And if you look below it, you have the Episcopal Church. This is going to be an offshoot of Anglicanism, which is an offshoot of the Roman Catholic Church. There's a lot of similarities there. Uh, but the Episcopal Church was created after the American Revolution, kind of to get away from the British, in a, in a sense. Um, and then from the Anglicans, there is another subgroup that will far, form during the first Great Awakening called the Methodists. And that's the first Great Awakening. That's the 1730s and 1740s. Uh, okay, and then if you, the next one you see the Lutherans, I said that already. And then you have the Reformed churches, and that includes the Calvinists. Now, this chart is very uh, centered towards the, this is American History Channel. <laughs> so that's why it's kind of um, um, American-centric, if that's the right word. But you have the Reformed churches, and within the, those Reformed churches included the state reformed churches which were in Germany and Scotland and different countries. And from Scotland came the Presbyterians. So the Presbyterians, you'll see lots of Presbyterian churches in the United States, and they came from Scotland. The Scotland Im- immigrants brought it. Then you have the dissenters, and the dissenters are the Puritans. They also have the Huguenots, which were in France, which were persecuted in France because it's a Catholic country. Uh, but the Puritans were dissenters. They were separatists or non-separatists. You know, it depends on whether you're a pilgrim or a Puritan. But nonetheless, they were dissenting from the Anglican Church. And um, and they were Calvinists. They believed in predestination. That's why I said earlier, it doesn't matter what you do. If you're good or bad, you're going to hell or heaven. That's already decided for you. So it wasn't very egalitarian. They also did things like cancel Christmas, and they wouldn't let people gather for for fun festivals and stuff like that. Now, that strict religion is not going to last forever. That's going to be in the 1600s. Um, And the Puritans are going to go in different directions. Some are going to become Baptists. Some are going to become Presbyterians. But a lot of them will continue the Puritan religion, which will, another word is really for it is also Congregationalist. But they're going to liberalize and they're going to become less strict over the, over the decades and centuries. Uh, now, the Baptists is also important. They came from the Reformed churches, and they also came from the Anabaptists. And this is important in American history, at least, because if you look at the denominations today, the largest percentage of Protestants today are Baptists, followed by Methodists. So that's why I put it on here. And... This, this religion started at the, near the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, but in the United States, it was Roger Williams who was banished from the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he left Massachusetts to start his own colony, which was Rhode Island. And he's the one, or at least his congregation or his people, um, they opened up the first Baptist church in the United States. And it wasn't very influential at that time, but during the Second Great Awakening, it's going to become very influential. And then the Anabaptist, uh, I, it's behind my picture there. I'm not going to move my picture. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, the Amish, the Amish, sorry. Uh, the A- A- A-M-I-S-H. <laughs> sorry for my pronunciation. I will remove it. The Amish, uh, they're going to be, you know, they live very, very simple lives. They're going to come from this group, the uh, Anabaptists. 
So if you are a theologian or an expert in this, I would love to get your comments about this chart. Please write it below. Uh, any way I can make this a little bit more understandable. This is a very simplified um, chart, but I hope it makes it a little bit clearer. Okay, um, I want to talk about the Methodists because the Methodists, they grew the largest during the Second Great Awakening. So we're still on that topic of the Second Great Awakening, that religious zeal, those horseback riders going throughout the country, spreading the word of these new denominations of the Christian Bible. Uh, now this, like I mentioned before, started during the Great Awakening. You know, George Whitefield, uh, John Wesley, uh, some people call it the Wesleyan Church. Um, and it was this, this idea of salvation was available to everybody, right? And that was different at that time because it wasn't available to everybody in certain parts of the country. Um, but this was the most successful during the Second Great Awakening. It became 34% of the Protestant church membership was Methodist by 1850. So it grew rapidly in those 50 years. And today it's about 10%, uh, but it's still very significant. But they used these circuit riders, and they would spread the message throughout the United States and throughout the West. And they had it all mapped out. They had cities and towns mapped out so they could hit all these towns. They could spread the word to as many people as possible. And then they would find people. They would, find, they would go to homes. They would go to churches. They would go to town meetings. And they would introduce the Methodist religion to people. And this helped spread Christianity. And what's the big picture here? What, why is this all important? Well, when you go to the United States today, you might go by a Methodist church or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or an Anglican church or a Catholic cathedral. Where did that come from? Well, this is where it came from. Uh, and also the Methodists, also within the Methodist uh, creed, they also have the first African Methodist Episcopal Church, which was opened in Pennsylvania. Uh, so that was the first independent church opened by blacks at that time. And the Baptists, in the, they started back in the 1600s. And in the United States, they started in Rhode Island with the first church being uh, in 1638. Uh, but like the Methodists, Methodists, they grew rapidly too. Not as much as the Methodists, but they did grow rapidly. And today the, the Baptists are the largest Protestant denomination. And the Baptists, and again, these religions, they're, 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 there's a lot, it's Christianity, right? It's Christian. There's just small different beliefs and traditions that they follow. For the, so the Baptists, they believe in baptism, baptism so baptizing a child to, um, to, to join or to, to accept God, uh, accept the, 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 the Christian faith. Um, also communion. Uh, so these are some of the small differences that you might see within the, bath, uh, the Baptists and other religions. Um, but it is all Christianity. Now, this is an interesting story. is the Church of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormonism, which today you'll see lots of uh, Mormon communities in the Utah area and different parts of America as well. But Joseph Smith, now he, he grew up in New England in the, in the Northeast. Now the Second Great Awakening began in Kentucky, Tennessee, and spread throughout the country, but it was very significant in New York. It was called the Burnt Out District because there was different denominations having these huge revivals in camp meetings um, and all these different ideas being spread uh, that were kind of challenging old ideals. And Joseph Smith said, or he asked God, who, who sh which one should I follow? And he got a message or some type of signal that don't trust any of them, that they were all wrong. So one day he was visited by some angels that directed him to some golden plates that told of God's dealings with the former inhabitants of the American continent who were Christians. And he recorded this the text from the golden plates and it was written in some like archaic Egyptian hieroglyphic type of language so God helped him translate it and he wrote the Book of Mormon it took him a couple years but the holy scriptures of the Mormons today is the Book of Mormon and also the Bible and he would send missionaries throughout the US and Britain and Ireland to spread the word of Mormonism and at that time, Mormons were not always accepted by Protestants. So sometimes they were attacked. And though they started in New York, they had to move to Ohio, and then to Missouri, and then to Illinois. And in Illinois, Joseph Smith was killed 
uh, by a mob of people. Uh, and then they would ultimately end up near the Salt Lake in uh, Utah, where you will see a large community today, and you'll see this beautiful um, Salt Lake Temple, which is for, for the Mormons. So here, just remember, the Methodists, that was a new religion during the First Great Awakening, and this is a new religion during the Second Great Awakening, and you can see these temples today. Now, these movements would also be challenged, um, or their orthodoxy would be challenged um, by other movements, like the Unitarians, right? So um, the, the Unitarians, they were around since the 1500s in Europe, and uh, it was related to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, in the United States, it became more prominent in the Second Great Awakening. And the difference between the Unitarians and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Anglicans and the other dif different Protestant denominations is they did not believe Jesus um, was a deity or a God, or they didn't believe in the Trinity. They believed that Jesus was a, was a, sha a Savior, a moral man, somebody to take your moral direction from. A person, in, in essence, right? But they still believed in God, but they just didn't believe Jesus was 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 it was a deity or a God. Um, and that's certainly something different uh, for a religious country, certainly at that time. But in 1836, a bunch of um, preachers, uh, Unitarian preachers, they formed what is called uh, the Transcendental Club. And the Transcendental Dental club would form into what is known as transcendentalism. This is in the 1830s and the 1840s. So, this is a philosophical, spiritual, artistic expression and literary movement. So, it challenged uh, Protestant orthodoxy, right? Especially um, the belief is, for example, of Jesus as being, you know, um, a deity or a god. And they question God altogether, to be honest with you. Uh, they also questioned government and its relation, government itself. They also challenged government, but also its relationship to religion. So the idea of church and state. And they were also very self-sufficient and individualistic, right? Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was a transcendentalist, you know, self-reliance. He wrote that book, um, the essay. And he also believed in oneness, oneness with nature. So... Again, Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on, on nature. Uh, so this is kind of these new new age at the time, uh, different thinking. Um, and there was a lot of prominent transcendentalists, like I said, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller is another one, and then, of course, Henry David Thoreau is one of the most famous ones. Now, this guy, he was an abolitionist. You know, that's you know, not just him. The transcendentalists were against slavery. Uh, and Henry David Thoreau, he believed in nonviolent action. So he believed in making chains and questioning and challenging the state or the government, government, but doing it without violence. Uh, civil disobedience, which is the, basically the same thing, right? Uh, so if a law is unjust, disobey it. So don't go out and burn a city or kill people to, to fight back against the system. Just don't follow their rules. Uh, I think the best example of, and he wrote the book, Civil Disobedience. I think the one of the greatest examples of civil disobedience is Rosa Parks. So she, during segregation, was told to stand up in a bus because she was sitting in the white section. And she disobeyed. She said, I'm not, sta I'm not standing up. And she disobeyed what's, what was a law, right? So she didn't cause bodily harm or um, didn't hurt anybody. Uh, she disobeyed a law that she thought was unjust, and great change came from it. And this idea of civil disobedience also influenced people like Gandhi in India, who also believed in nonviolence and civil disobedience. And Martin Luther King, who, was, who also believed in nonviolence in the 1960s in um, the civil rights movement. Um, citizens should not recognize a government that passes unjust laws. Yep, that goes along with civil disobedience. He also believed in simple leaving, leaving, living. So if you know um, about Henry David Thoreau, you know he lived on Walden, near Walden Pond, for two years to live the simple life. 
right, to understand life. It was almost like a spiritual religious belief. And in it, he speaks of God, right? So he sounds kind of like a Unitarian in a way. He, 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 he was raised in the Unitarian tradition. Um, but Walden, uh, he wrote a book about it and he explained his, his, his experiences there. Um, one interesting thing about Walden, though, is, number one, supposedly he did sneak out of his isolation in the woods <laughs> sometimes uh, to go to the city to get stuff, right? And also that Walden Pond, it was owned by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Just a little interesting tidbit. Now, the Second Great Awakening and these philosophical movements influence reform in the United States. What reform? Temperance movement. So this was a great threat to society, right? Women often be abused, uh, were abused by their drunk husbands, um, and they would often be very active in the temperance movement. So women, women had a, a large voice during this movement. They also had a large voice during the Second Great Awakening. Uh, whiskey was widely available. It was cheap, and it was uh, actually safer than water sometimes because it's not like today where you get a bottle of water or you go to the sink. Water could be quite dangerous and could kill people. Uh, this movement also increased tensions between the middle class and the poor. So this was kind of a middle class movement, right? And just imagine uh, the Irish coming, working hard, and they like to drink. And then a middle class person saying, don't drink, or looking down upon them. So this also raised some, some tension between the classes. Uh, in 1826, you have the American Temperance Society. So you have the Anti-Slavery Society, and you have the American Temperance Society uh, trying to eradicate alcohol, really. Um, while it was not eradicated uh, from 1840 to 1820, drinking w was down 50%. So there was some progress in, in that. And of course, you know, between 1920 and 1930, you will have an amendment that makes alcohol illegal in the United States. But that won't last long. Now, the temperance movement was actually probably one of the biggest movements at the time. The anti-slavery and abolition movement was not as big, but it was getting bigger and bigger all the way into 1850 when it's going to be closer to civil war, right? Now, anti-slavery sentiments had been around since the beginning of the United States. Some of the founding fathers discussed making slavery illegal when they were writing the Constitution. Even Thomas Jefferson, who owned many slaves and had children with one of his slaves, uh, spoke about writing the, 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 the horrors of slavery in the Declaration of Independence. But a lot of people at that time said, do not do it because you're going to cause a separation between the North and the South. Um, so people thought slavery would just fade away. It would just kind of go away after some time, after some years, after some decades. And in essence, in the North, that's, that is what happened. But in the South, that is not what happened, Right. Uh, in the North, there was something called gradual uh, emancipation. So people gradually abolished slavery. Not every state at the same time. Different, sta different states at different, in different years and in different ways. So, for example, some people would remain slaves until they died, while maybe younger generations would be freed after five or ten years. Um, but in the South, it's legal. And at this time, in let's say the 1830s, there's this idea of gradual emancipation. That's what they did in the North. Uh, and there was this idea of expatriation of freed slaves to Africa. So people at that time did not know if the freed slaves could live with the white masters or near them or near white people in the South because of cultural differences, because of uh, racism or prejudice. Uh, the prejudice prejudices that still existed uh, that would certainly exist after slavery was done uh, so some a lot of people said okay uh, the black slaves would be sent to Africa right and you would be surprised that you there's even quotes from Abraham Lincoln before the Civil War where, where he spoke about the, the exact same thing from today's lenses that seems ridiculous but back then they, they didn't know what would happen after slavery ended uh, but in the mid-1800s, uh, 1840s, it's going to change from gradual eman emancipation to immediate uh, emancipation. So not like the North, stop it right away. 
Uh, and also, they didn't believe in people changed their minds. They didn't believe in this uh, expatriation. They thought the the blacks had had built America, and they should have the same liberties and the same enjoyment that the other people had in society. So it wasn't sending the blacks back to to Africa, letting them stay and enjoy the United States. But of course, it's going to take a century before. Um, before blacks will get the, the same rights in, in the South. But there's going to be hundreds of anti-slavery societies that are developed, and there's going to be anti-slavery pamphlets that spread throughout the country. So it's getting bigger and bigger and more influential um, over the years. So in the 1830s, uh, the anti-slavery movement is growing rapidly. In the 1840s, it moves from reform to resistance. So... People want change, and people are resisting, and people are letting um, freed runaway slaves um, get away in the north or helping them escape from the south to the north. Uh, in the 1850s, the, the anti-slavery movement is even more pronounced and more dangerous. And when I say more dangerous, I mean abolitionists were s still in the minority, and they were often attacked, uh, or their printing presses were attacked, or their meeting places were attacked. So it was kind of dangerous to be an abolitionist, even in, in the North. And of course, the North and the South was getting closer and closer to, to a war. Uh, I have to mention William Lloyd Garrison. He's one of the most prominent abolitionists. And he was a printer, and he printed The Liberator. He started it. And this was an anti-slavery publication that was widely read, and it gave updates about the, the, the abolitionist movement and, 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 and pushed and encouraged people to... To, to abolish slavery. Uh, he was a very religious man. He initially believed in gradual emancipation, but he changed his mind to immediate uh, emancipation. And he was friends with this guy, Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass, he escaped slavery. He lived as a slave. And he would end up to become a national leader of the abolitionist movement. So he moved to the North. He changed his name to Frederick Douglass uh, because he didn't want to get caught. And he met, actually, William Lloyd Garrison, who encouraged them to, you know, be a speaker and to write about it. And this man was brilliant. You know, he had one master when he was a slave who taught him to read and write. And then that master's husband stopped that, but he would continue to learn. He would learn from street kids, and he would teach other uh, slaves how to read the Bible. So this was a very brilliant writer and speaker. And William Lloyd Garrison noticed that with him. Uh, and he would later write the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. Um, and after slavery is done, after the Civil War, he's going to move on to other movements. And before, other movements, which include Native American rights, also women's rights as well. So he's very reform-minded and very influential uh, be, you know, in the antebellum society, the be, be, before the American Civil War society and, and after. Now, women's rights movement is also going to start to to move forward as well. So during the Second Great Awakening, well, I should mention before that, it wasn't very common for a woman to speak at a church or to have a leadership position in the church. But during the Second Great Awakening, when they're having these big revivals and they're having these big camp meetings, women's had a voice and they were had leadership positions and they were speaking to large crowds of people, Baptists and Methodists. Now, after the Second Great Awakening, some of those traditions or those religions cut back. They said, maybe we, we went too far, right? But it was a good first step. Um, but women's rights, in, they, wanted, they wanted to be treated properly, right? So women, they didn't have the right to own property. The husband, their husband owned their property. They didn't have the right to initiate a divorce. So she had a terrible husband. It had to be the husband who, who, who initiated the divorce. They couldn't sign wills, they couldn't sign contracts, and they couldn't vote, right? So women's rights was moving forward, and, and it's going to gain speed. And you can look at the Second Great Awakening as the, the impetus for this movement. Um, and it was also often tied to the abolitionist movement, right? So women were very outspoken about uh, the abolition of slavery. And in fact, in 1840, at the World Anti-Slavery Convention, this happened in London, and it was trying to end slavery around the world. And um, two people, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Ka Katie Stanton, they attended, among many other women. 
and they were not given the seats, right? So they went all that way, and they wanted to be a part of this movement for equality for blacks who are not, or anybody who's a slave, and they're not treated fairly. They're not given a seat, right? So it's Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They go back to the United States, New York, and they organize the Seneca Falls Convention. And in there, they fought for their social, civil, and religious rights. And they, they, they listed some grievances and some solutions to these grievances. And amongst those, they wanted the property rights. Many of the things I just mentioned that they don't have, they want property rights. Uh, they want to have access to jobs that they don't have access to. Uh, and they wanted to vote. In fact, when uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton mentioned that, even the women at the convention thought that was crazy. Like, oh, that's going a little bit too far, right? But it was from there that the women's suffragist movement was started, and it became more and more common. But at that time, it was it was a radical idea. And of course, it's going to be 70 years before women have the right to vote. So it's going to be a long time. Um, another movement is the national is is national the Native Americans you know support for the Native Americans. Um, there's a continuity in American history of broken contracts and wars and uh, different tribes from around the United States being forced out by war or by laws from areas in the United States. And in 1830s, I'm not exactly sure which year, but in 1830s, it's going to be Andrew Jackson who signs the Indian Removal Act. And this is going to, it doesn't force, but it's, it's an agreement that the Native Americans in the South, which includes tribes like the Cherokee and the, um, and the Creeks and the Seminoles, that they need to move to the west of the Mississippi. And it's kind of a, an agreement that there will be funding for the transportation and for uh, them settling down in, in their new territory, in the, in, which will be the Oklahoma area. Um, but in reality, they, under the next administration, Martin Van Buren, they, are, they will be forced to, in some instances, some tribes will be forced to move. And it's going to lead to the Trail of Tears, where they have to walk hundreds of miles and thousands of Native Americans are going to die. So the estimates are between 4,000 and 6,000, and it might be much more than that. Uh, I'm not sure. But the reason I put that in this presentation is um, there was a lot of the Christian society that was the reform-minded, um, the missionary-minded, the Second Great Awakening-minded that were supporting the Native Americans that spoke against the government for these actions and wanted to, 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 to give them sovereignty. In fact, there was a court case around the same time where they were given sovereignty. It was a kind of a limited sovereignty in Georgia where they could stay there and they would they wouldn't have to listen to everything that Georgia or the federal government said. They would have some type of an anonymity, not 100%. But that was completely ignored under the Martin Van Buren um, administration, and they were they were sent to to the West. Um, and it was it was some of these these Christian reformers that were trying to to help the Native Americans. So that is it. So when you look at the United States today. I think you can see some of what we talked about today. So when you look at, uh, when you're walking down the street and you see a church, check out what type of church is it. If it's Methodist, just know it started during the first uh, Great Awakening, right? If it's Baptist, just know that it started even earlier than that, but it, it expanded during the, the second Great Awakening and it gained its popularity. If you see a Mormon temple, well, then you'll know where that started, right? It started during the Second Great Awakening. Or an Anglican church, it started from when the United States was part of uh, British, the British, right? And that it's influenced from, from the Church of England. Um, and also reform movements. There's lots of reform movements, people always trying to make life better, and they're, they're speaking their voices. There's always some problems that need to be fixed. In the 1800s, there was lots of problems. There was... There was problems with drinking. There was problems with prostitution. There was problems with gambling, with dueling, right? Uh, and of course, there was the horrors of slavery, and then people not being treated properly, like women and Native Americans were not even American citizens, and it was their their land for hundreds of thousands of years. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, that's it for me today. Uh, if you made it this far, I really appreciate it. And if you made it this far, you gotta give me a, a thumbs up, right? <laughs> 
Um, and also please share my videos. Uh, I'm trying to get more people to watch these. I spend a lot of time uh, doing this research and preparing this PPT. And if you're interested in the PPT, check out my story below. So that's it for me today. I'll see you next time.